Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it. Thank you. It's being written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing forth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you on messages regarding end time events and preparing for the things that are coming. We've talked about the fact that when Jesus comes back, is he going to find faith on the earth? We've talked about the importance of us understanding what it means to walk by faith and all the things that are of necessity to see ourselves come to the place of being in faith. We've talked about many things and about faith and about hope and also talked about eliminating hindrances and enemies against it today. Today, tonight we're going to talk about how we put our faith in operation, how we confess the word, how we work our faith effectively, and this is important for everyone to understand because there has been teaching in the body of Christ that is erroneous regarding this subject, as you will see. We begin in Romans chapter 10, verse 8. What saith it? The word, rhema, that which is the spoken word, is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the spoken word of faith that we preach. And what is it about this spoken word? What's important about the speaking of the word? That's how you put your faith in operation. We know that because we saw that we have a general spirit of faith when we get born again. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13. We having the same spirit of faith, it's a spirit of faith. It has nothing to do with your feelings, nothing to do with your will or mind. It's a spirit of faith. According to that, it's written, we, I believe, therefore, by spoken, we also believe and therefore speak. When we believe God's word that brings specific faith to us, then we speak to put it in operation our faith, releasing our faith to work our faith, which must be done. Now, we must realize that if we go back to Romans chapter 10, as it says in verse 9, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Because you're confessing him as your Lord and also seeing what God accomplished for you, accomplished the redemption, and he's the first boy, he's the one who was raised from out of spiritual death unto spiritual life and got the new spirit for us. Then he goes on and he reverses it, the order. With the heart man believes unto righteousness. We believe the word in our heart. And with the mouth, confession is made or is speaking this unto salvation to bring salvation into, ma into manifestation. So the speaking with your mouth is what is going to produce the results because you're releasing your faith and bringing it into manifestation, the salvation. Now, when you're speaking with your mouth, what are you speaking? You're going to speak what the Word says and you're going to be speaking the promises that belong to you, and you're also going to be speaking what you need to do to bring those promises into manifestation or release what God purposes to come to pass. We see something in Psalms 50 that shows us something. You and I have come into covenant relationship, and we see in Psalms 50, verse 16, he's saying this to the wicked who are not right with God. But look at what he's saying to him. Unto the wicked, God says, What hast thou do to do to declare my statutes? Can they speak the word and see anything come to pass? No, because they're wicked. They're not right with God. Or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth. Notice they were trying to take the covenant in the mouth by speaking the word of the covenant, speaking the promises. And of course, they can't do it. But this also reveals the fact that those who are right with God, they are to take the covenant in their mouth because you are going to speak what the Word says, which is putting your faith into operation. When you have the Word of God in you and you speak it forth, the Holy Spirit is the one who is a performer of the Word, as well as the angels that hearken to the voice of the Word, we see a scripture in 2 Samuel 23, 2. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me. And how did he do that? Because he always does things in line with the word. His word was in my tongue. You are going to speak his word 
and put him in operation to accomplish the things that he purposes to bring the promises into manifestation. Now, we have the faith of Jesus, remember? When we get born again, we have the same spirit of faith. We get specific faith, remember, by hearing the Word of God. There's a difference between having the general spirit of faith and having specific faith. The general spirit of faith is what you put in operation by mixing that with the specific faith that you get from the Word. Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. This is specific faith as you hear particular scriptures or particular parts of the Word of God. It brings faith in that particular area. Hearing the Word on healing will bring you faith for healing. Bringing, hearing the Word for having wisdom will bring faith for wi getting wisdom. These things are going to, to bring faith in your heart. And also remember the Word is also written in your mind producing hope as the covenant is, remember, in, these, in the New Testament era, which we're in, we see in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. So the word gets into our heart, into our mind. We see the opposite said in chapter 10, verse 16, where it says, this is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. So you look at those two together, and it says he's going to put and write his laws into your heart and into your mind. In your heart it produces faith, in your mind it produces hope. Now, once you have the word in you, you're having faith and you're having hope, then you need to bring those hopes into being. And you are going to bring the hopes into being by speaking those. Hebrews 10.23 tells us this. It says in the King James, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. It's a mistake because the word faith is not faith. It is not the word pistis, which is the Greek word for faith. It is the word elpis, as you see. And this particular word, which we can show you, it has been used 54 times, LPs has in the New Testament, the Greek, 53 times translated hope correctly, one time erroneously translated faith, and this is where it is. Every other translation corrects it to hope, because this is talking about the confession of your hope. What am I doing? I'm confessing the word that is in my mind that I know, and I'm speaking that promise. And we must do it without wavering, knowing that he is faithful, the one who has promised. At the same time, we're also going to be speaking forth the word as we saw, you know, speak forth, believe to bring our faith into operation as we confess what the word says to release our faith. So we're going to confess our hope, but we also are going to confess our faith when we speak the word. We do see that we are to mix the specific word that we have with our general spirit of faith. Hebrews 4.1, let us therefore fear lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. We're not supposed to come short of any. We're supposed to possess every promise. Possessing the promise is how you enter into his spiritual rest, possessing the promises of God. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. That meant they heard the word, and what happens when you hear the word? It brings faith to you because the word comes into your heart. It brings hope to you as the word comes into your mind. But notice, the word preached did not profit them. Does the word automatically profit you just because you heard it and it gets into your heart and in your mind? It produced faith in your heart. It produces hope in your mind, but it doesn't automatically work. You have to do something with it. And it says, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. How do I mix that which I've heard with my faith? It's with your general spirit of faith. By you believe that word in your heart, you believe that word in your mind. You see, you maintain faith and hope within. And then you speak forth as I believe, therefore I speak, to put your faith in operation. And as we pointed out, this is how God brings everything into being, by speaking things into being. When we see in the creation, 
God said, let there be light, or light be, and there was light, light was. He spoke at first, releasing that which is of the Spirit, it came from the Spirit, and then it came into manifestation. We also pointed out today, earlier, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, how everything came into being. Again, it's by him speaking these things into being as God put his faith in operation, speaking the word. Through faith, we understand not the worlds, this is not the word cosmos, it's the word aeon, which means ages, ages. Young's corrects the error. We understand that the ages were, it says framed, but this really means they were put in order and prepared and brought to be completed, this word can mean brought into being, by the spoken word, that's what rhema means, of God, which what happens when you speak the word? That's how the word of faith works. It released the faith as it spoke forth. So that things which are seen, everything in the seen realm, were not made of things which do appear. Instead, they came from things which do not appear meaning everything that was spoken from the Word, which is spiritual law in the Spirit, was spoken forth, releasing that which is of the Spirit to bring things into manifestation in the natural. That's the same way you and I are going to do things. We're going to speak the Word of the Spirit, the spiritual words, spiritual law. We're going to speak spiritual promises. We're going to speak the Word of God that is Spirit, and we're going to then see our faith be put in operation to bring those things in the, the promises of God into manifestation. Jesus, of course, understood this. This is the way he operated, by speaking things into being. Hebrews 1, verse 3. Who be in the brightness of his glory and express image of his person, upholding all things by the rhema, which is the word, things, something that's spoken, the spoken word, of his power, meaning the spoken word released his power because the power is resident in the word, but it's not active until you speak it to put it in operation. And when it says upholding, this also, this word is translated bring or bring forth many times, and it really means to bring something forth or bring it into being, bring it forward, meaning that he brought forth all things by the spoken word of his power. He spoke things, and that's how everything comes into manifestation, just like God spoke things. As he spoke, he said, God said, God said, God said, God said, and continually in Genesis chapter 1, bringing everything into being. Now, at the same time, that means we got to speak the right words. At the same time, enemies are against you, and they're going to try to get to you, and they're going to speak things at you as well, to try to contaminate you, which they will do. Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 46. All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. Anything that is spoken contrary to the word is not coming from God, it's coming from an enemy. That's why you've got to take heed what you hear, as Jesus said, and how you hear, so you're only hearing the right things and you're, you're going to make sure that you're going to deal with anything that's not of God that's being spoken. You don't want to hear things that are contrary to the Word of God. So the enemies were opening their mouths against them. That means anything that you hear, even out in the world, the things that these people are speaking, that are speaking lies and their propaganda and all the things, <laughs> if you let them affect you, they will. You've got to make sure that you deal successfully with any enemies that are opening their mouths against you. That's why you need to cast down everything and you need to replace everything in line with the Word of God. If you learn to speak right words, you will overcome any and all things that are spoken against you. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord, mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies. You can speak words that will enlarge, triumph, rise above your enemies by speaking the truth, by speaking the word, by speaking against what they would say so that they do not have place in your life. We know that 
as it says over in Isaiah chapter 54. It tells us what do we do when people have spoken things that are contrary to the word against us. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon that's formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, what do you do? You're going to condemn it. You condemn those tongues. You don't agree with them. You cast them down. You refuse to accept them. And you get the word in you and you speak what the word says. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness of me. This is for those who are righteous are going to be able to do this. We need to speak right words. It's quite a revealing scripture of what controls what is going on in throughout the earth, as a matter of fact. Words that are spoken. That's why we need to speak the right words, the word of God. People need to hear the word and the word has power and it will bring things into being. Look at the scripture that it says in Proverbs 11, verse 11. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. We speak right words. But it's overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. That's why you've got to counter anything that the wicked speak, or anything that is spoken even by someone who might be born again, who's not speaking in line with the word of God. You've got to speak the right words. The blessing of the upright will bring forth a city being exalted, that would be God's work going in operation. But it's overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. God wants you to learn to speak right words at all times. Now, also, we have authority and dominion in the heavenlies, remember, against all the evil spirits. We see in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, it speaks about Jesus. He wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. See, when Jesus came at first, he came, his kingdom, he wasn't in his kingdom yet, remember. He came and operated from the kingdom of, from heaven that was the Father's, but he hadn't come into his kingdom yet until he was born from spiritual death unto spiritual life, got the new spirit for mankind, and came, came into the kingdom of his dear son, that's the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and he was made, set there in heaven, as given, given the scepter of righteousness, the scepter of his kingdom, and declared king of kings and lord of lords, and his kingdom came into manifestation at that point in time. And this is talking about when he's now seated at the right hand of the Father. Look what he says far above all principality, and power, and might, and dominion, and every name its name, not only in this age, aeon, but also in that which is to come. He's put all things under his feet. Jesus, when he came into his position in the kingdom, what does that have to do with us? Well, remember, we have a spirit. We got born again. We have the same spirit his, he has, so therefore we're in the same position. We see this declared in Ephesians 2, 6. He's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're not talking about where you physically are. Physically, you're here. But in spirit, because you have the same spirit, you're in the same position that he is in, in spirit, where you have authority, you're seated in heavenly places, you're in that same position of dominion that he is in. And because of the fact of that, then what do we do? We are to use that authority against all the evil spirits in the heavenlies, and we are to wrestle against them as we see. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, the powers, the authorities, this means, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. And how are we going to do that? We're going to speak words that are going to release authority. Remember, he has given us authority over all the power of the enemy, and you're going to put your authority into operation. We see in Matthew chapter 16, in verse 19, where it speaks, I give unto thee the keys. What are keys? Means of access into something or to open something up, to go get into something. Of the kingdom, that's the rule and the reign. Of what? Of heaven? No, it's a mistake in the King James and in most all translations because it's not singular. It's plural. We'll show you. Here is Scrivener's, which is the basis for the King James Version. This is the word for heaven. Notice, it is plural. And then he uses the word heaven two more times. 
Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What about those words? They're also plural. Here's the second word, heaven, plural. And then we come down to the last word, also plural. What does that tell us? Well, this tells us that it makes a big difference. We're not talking about the keys of the kingdom of heaven where God is. We're talking about the keys of the kingdom, the rule and the reign of the heavens, where all the evil spirits are. The principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, we have now authority and we have the means of access to the rule and the reign of the heavens. So what are we going to do with our authority? Whatsoever you might bind, this means not shall bind, but might bind, because it's what's called a subjunctive mood, which is a conditional statement. Whatsoever you might bind on earth, well, you're on earth, so you're going to be the binding from here, shall be, that's the main verb in the clause, as you see, shall be, the reason you know, because it's what's called the indicative mood, which is the main verb, is will be an indicative mood in the Greek. Now, when it says bound, this is a participle. It is modifying the main word, a participle. And what this is saying is that whatsoever you might bind on earth shall be, and the way you would translate a participle is as Young's brings it out, having been bound in the heavens. Who goes in and carries out that work? The angels. The angels will war in the spirit against these evil spirits. But where's the authority released from? From you and me, because we have been given the authority and we are responsible now to speak you're going to bind with your mouth. And when you speak that, you're releasing your faith, the authority you have. Just because you have the authority doesn't mean it's operating. You've got to put it in operation. And you put it in operation with your words as you bind those spirits, which means to tie them up. And you also can loose the same thing. Whatsoever you might loose on earth shall be, having been loosed in the heavens. You're, this is how you're going to release your faith to use the authority to conquer the, and take the rule and reign in the heavens over all of these evil spirits. And we are expected to do that. We see another scripture that's similar to this in Matthew 11, verse 12, as far as what it's referring to. From the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom, the rule and the reign of not heaven, again, it is plural. Here's the word plural, heavens, as Young's brings out, suffereth violence, means that there's, it's the word biadzo, which means there's force and violence that's, impl impl that's released, applied, or inflicted upon something in the heavens. And that's where the evil spirits are. So the rule and the reign of the heavens is seeing the application of force and violence against what's in the heavens, which are the evil spirits. And the violent, strong, forceful ones, who is who? The church, if they have gotten strong and forceful through the word in them, what are they doing? They're seizing control of it. They're taking control of it. That's what we're supposed to do. We have authority in the earth. We have authority in the heavens against all these evil spirits. And we have to put our authority in operation in order to see God accomplish what he purposes. Because people haven't understood this. They, pretty much the evil spirits have been able to operate pretty unhindered in the heavens over all these places. We are sure to be binding them. We cast them down. We throw them down. We root them out. We have authority and dominion over them. We put our faith in operation by speaking forth and doing the binding, loosing, or casting down. You also have, was another scripture that shows us what we do dealing with that which is in the heavens. It's um, over in Jeremiah, chapter 1, verse 10. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms. Well, the kingdoms are what these evil spirits have been ruling over them, and the nations, the evil spirits are operating over these nations. To root out, pull down, destroy, throw down, as well as to build and to plant. Anything that needs to be eliminated is to be cast down, thrown down, and brought destruction to it. This is what we do in the heavenlies to conquer all of the evil spirits' activities 
and to stop their works and to bind, loose, cast down, throw down, and eliminate their works. Now, in putting our faith in operation in regards to the promises of God and seeing God do things, we must understand in Hebrews chapter 3, it's Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Wherefore, holy brethren, you and I are the holy brethren, if we're walking in holiness, of course, partakers of the heavenly calling. We have a calling of God upon us. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, which is meaning what you speak, your confession or your profession, things you're declaring, Christ Jesus. So that means our profession that we're speaking is doing something involving the ministry of Jesus, who is in a high priestly ministry at the right hand of the Father now. What happens when we speak the Word of God? Jesus takes that and does something with it. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, it says this, Whosoever therefore shall confess me, well, that'd be confessing him as Lord, but also he is the Word, so if you confess the Word, you're also confessing him before men. Him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. The principle is this. Whatever you speak in line with the Word, he's going to take it and confess that before the Father in heaven. And why is that? For the release of that promise or whatever you're being sp spoken forth to be released because it's coming from heaven where we have an inheritance and all, all of our, or we're blessed with all spiritual heaven, spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, whoever will deny me though, you're going to be denied before the Father. Otherwise, things aren't going to come to pass from the covenant that belongs to you in heaven if you speak things contrary to the word, if you deny him, which would be speaking wrong things. Not only does Jesus take what we confess and confess it before the Father, but he also confesses it before the angels. The angels carry out the Word of God to bring the things to pass. We see this in Luke 12, verse 8. I say unto whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. We'll be confessed before the angels. What do the angels do? The angels are going to go forth to carry out the word of God. But what happens if we don't? He that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. Well, that means the angels won't work for us. And what are the angels supposed to do? Well, the angels, remember in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13, speaking about the angels, verse 14 says, Are they not all serving or ministering spirits? sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation. Who is us? That's us. What are we to do? We are the ones who are going to speak the word. The angels that will minister for us are going to go out and carry out this because we have an, we have an inheritance for to come bring, it, bring it into manifestation. The angels will carry it out. And we know angels will always do what the word says when it's put in operation because of Psalms 103, verse 20, which says, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that are strong and mighty. The word excel is not a good word. It's the word gabor, which means strong and mighty. They're strong and mighty in strength and power. That do his commandments. They carry out the commandments. When you act upon them, and you, things that you do, They'll go out there to perform the Word of God. And they hearken to the voice of the Word. The Word that they hear, that you spoke, that Jesus took and spoke before them, they're going to hearken to it and go and carry it on out and see it be accomplished for us. You've got to understand that your words will activate the angels to do things. We can even see this in Daniel. Daniel chapter 10, remember he was praying? And in Daniel chapter 10, we come down to verse 12, when the angel showed up after the 21 days, remember? Daniel 10, 12, he said, Fear not, Daniel, from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words, because he began to speak words that first day, were heard, 
So the wor your words are heard immediately. Right. Not like, well, I wonder if God's hearing me. Yeah, he's hearing. The words are he he heard the first day if they're in line with the word. And I am come for thy words. Well, how long did it take him to get there? 21 days. Angels move with the flash of li light, you know, just the flash of lightning. So what was going on? There was some hindrance going on in the realm of the spirit. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me tw one in 20 days. So he's praying continually. The angel is our, going in operation because of his words. And 21 days go on as they're having this war fighting up in the realm of the heavens. Michael, when the chief priest princes come to help me and I remain there with the kings of Persia until he finally broke through. That shows you that when you speak, your words are heard. God is in operation for the things that you speak as long as they're in line with the word. Angels will go into operation against evil spirits and that doesn't mean that things are going to happen instantly. There may be a battle for a period of time, which it was here for 21 days before he finally got through. So that shows you that you continue to pray and speak so that then, as you do so, you're putting the angels in operation, which will work on your behalf. Now, in regards to the promises of God, we need to understand something. When we speak forth confession of the Word of God, what are we doing? We're actually, there's two aspects to the confession. First of all, you and I have already been given all the promises of God. They've already been given to us as far as what are right according to the New Testament. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us, past tense, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. This is all reserved in the document in heaven, which is the New Testament. Remember, we saw this earlier in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto what? We got born again to what? A living hope, confident expectancy through or through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to what? Now we have an inheritance because we are children, we're heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. We have an inheritance. That's all the things that would belong to us, the promises. Incorruptible, undefiled, fadeth not away, and where is it? It's reserved in heaven for you. The document of the New Testament that you're going to take hold of these promises is in heaven. It's reserved in heaven for you, and you are going to see this come into manifestation. So. Because it's up there, you're going to speak things that are going to activate this. First of all, you already have been given all these, have been blessed with all these spiritual blessings. So those are the things that he's already given to you. They would be the past tense scriptures showing promises that have already been given unto you. That's one aspect of what you're going to speak, because you're going to speak that particular scripture promise. The second thing, though, you're going to do is you're going to speak to release that scripture promise to come into manifestation in some manner of what you need to do to see it come to pass in your life. If you just speak the promise, that doesn't release it. That is declaring what your right is, your inherited right, the blessing that you've already been blessed with. But you need to do something to bring this into being. We'll just give you a good example. In other words, there's two aspects. One, what already belongs to us, we've already been given. Two, speaking to bring that into manifestation. Doing something to do that. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10 shows us a good example here. Look what it says. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now, in the New Testament, have obtained mercy. That means... That's one of the promises, the blessings that we've been given. Mercy is a right that you have. You have obtained mercy. By declaring that I have obtained mercy, does that cause mercy to come to me? No. That just means I have the right. I have obtained mercy, have obtained, past tense scripture, 
it's available for me. It's been given to me one of the spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Well, that's one aspect. So I'm going to declare the scripture says I now have obtained mercy. That's my right in Christ, part of my inheritance. So what am I going to do? There's another thing that we need to do. Hebrews chapter 4, to bring that mercy into manifestation. Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain, that's if we meet the conditions for it, which means we have to be right with God for one. It is a subjunctive mood verb, which means it's a conditional statement that we might obtain or take hold of mercy. Well, that tells us what we're going to do experientially as such, or to see that be manifest, we're going to take hold of the mercy of God. In other words, I'm going to declare that the word declares I have obtained mercy. It belongs to me. And because of that, now I'm going to come boldly to the throne of grace and take hold of mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Therefore, these are the two things we do. One, declaring what's been given to me. Two, do what's, speak or do what's necessary to take hold of that which is given to me, which is what I'm doing. I'm going to Lombano, take hold of that mercy, and I do that with my mouth as a prayer of faith, as I believe that I take hold of mercy. Mercy includes healing. You can do the same thing. You take hold of the mercy of healing. Mercy is the love of God in action towards you. Another example would be is using your authority. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 says, speaking of what Jesus accomplished, who hath delivered, that's past tense, us from the, not power, it's the word exousia, meaning authority, the authority of darkness. We're not under his authority, the authority of darkness, of Satan's authority any longer, because now we have a brand new spirit. We're now in Christ. We've been delivered from the authority of darkness, and what else? And he's translated us, past tense, into the kingdom of his dear son. Because remember, Jesus came into his kingdom when he was set at the right hand of the Father and proclaimed that now the scepter of, your, of the righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You know? So he's going to rule and reign. Now, you and I have come into that same position in the kingdom of Jesus Christ because we're seated in heavenly places with him as well in that position to rule and to reign. And remember, we're a royal priest, which is a ruling, kingly priest. Now we are to rule and reign under the lordship of Jesus. So, by declaring that I've been delivered from the authority of darkness and translated into the kingdom, that I'm in the kingdom, does that mean then that I'm ruling automatically? No. I just declared what's been done for me, the promise and the blessing that has already been given to me. I'm in that position. I have authority. Now I can use that authority to do something. So because I'm in the kingdom, what am I going to do? Well, I need to put the kingdom in operation. How am I going to put the kingdom in operation? I'm going to do something with my faith by speaking in order to release this authority. And here is an example. Matthew chapter 12, we already saw it when we used it in the, about the heavens, but here's another one. This is Jesus when he cast out the demons out of the man. He said, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. So this is telling us that now this is my action based on the authority I have that's releasing my faith to put this authority in operation by casting out the demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom has come into you. This caused the kingdom to be manifest. Otherwise, the kingdom's not manifest until I put my faith in operation for it to be manifest, to spring the rule and the reign of God into manifestation. So, what we are doing in speaking God's word is we're confessing what God has already done for us and has given us and has blessed us with all the past tense scripture promises. Then we are going to confess and or act on the word and do what 
the, the word says, in order to release him to do something for us, to bring that into manifestation, whether it's taking hold of mercy or whether it's bringing the kingdom of God into manifestation by using our authority, by casting out the demons, as in this particular case. The confession or the speaking of to put God in operation is you speaking things into being or speaking in such a way that causes the release of something. Like in this case, you're casting out the demons, commanding the demons to come out. You're putting the authority in operation. So you're going to speak things into being also. This is why Abraham had the God kind of faith. And in Romans chapter uh, 4, verse 17, we've talked about this. The way he operates is this. He was calling. This is a present tense word. Present tense, participle. Present tense means continuous ongoing action. Those things that be not, they're not happening, they're not present, they aren't occurring, as though, not that they were already, it's a mistake. We'll go back to this. This be, this is the word being. Notice this word, on. Then, when we come to the word were, if that is a correct translation, it's not going to be the same thing as the other one, but look at it. It's the same word, being. And it's the same word in the Greek. I can even show you when we look here. Here's the first word. If you look closely, you see those four letters. That's a well, omicron, they call it. That thing that looks like a crooked V is a new, it's an N sound, and that's a ta, T, and that's an alpha. Notice that there is an accent and there's a, a, a breathing thing over that O. That's the first one, and it means it's a present participle, means being. Now, here's the second word. Notice, it's the exact same letters, exact same thing. That shows you that it's being and being, not being and were, being and being. It's the same thing. Why is that important? Because this is a mistake. It's a critical mistake in the King James Version. Calling those things that are not being as being, that's what you're going to do. What does that mean? I'm going to call things that are not happening as happening. In other words, I'm going to be speaking things into being that aren't happening to bring them into being. And what am I doing? I'm actually speaking to what God, to what God will do for me. So I, what I'm speaking that God will do releases him to do it for me. You're speaking things into being. That is what you do. So as you learn to say what God is doing for you in a present tense declaration, because that's a release of faith, that releases him to do it for you. When you declare that healing power is flowing into my body as you take hold of it, then you release him for healing power to flow into your body. You're declaring what he is doing for you now based on what he has done for you. By his stripes you were healed. You have obtained mercy. You come boldly to the throne of grace and take hold of mercy. You take hold of his healing power. And you declare that it is flowing into your body. You're calling those things not being as being. I'm speaking this into being to release it to come into being. That is what you do. You speak things into being. This is critical. If you're going to learn to operate in faith, you're going to speak things into being. It's not speaking, well, God will do this someday. No, you're speaking with your faith to bring things into being. Faith brings things into being. So faith is speaking things into being. It's always present tense. It's not what will happen, future. It's what is happening as I'm speaking into being, I'm releasing it to come into being. Now, in Mark, chapter 11, Verse 23, we talked about this, but we've got to bring this up again. It's real important for you to understand. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, back, back, let's back up one scripture. We told you about this earlier. This is the scripture where Jesus answered and said to them, 
The King James says, have faith in God, not a good translation. The word in, which, which would be en normally in the Greek, it's not there. They just put that in there. There is, this is the word ha have, this is the word faith, and that's the word God. This is what's called the genitive, which is a, a possession. And this is the noun, accusative, which is like a direct object. And this is the main verb, which is an imperative, which means it's a command in present tense. So the way you would speak a imperative, active, uh, present tense, you would, it would be be continually having. Be continually having faith of God. A better way to think of it, though, because there's no the faith, and we already pointed out to you all the scriptures that showed the faith, speaking of the specific true faith. A better way to understand this, because it's not in, is he's a command for you to be continually having God's faith. The faith of God can be said the same way, God's faith. You and I are continually commanded to have God's faith, which means we're to have this thing in operation. And so he goes in the next verse and he tells you, this is how you're going to put God's faith in operation, because we do have the general spirit of faith, remember. We have a measure of faith. We have like precious faith as we've already seen in, in this morning. Mark 11:23. Verily I say unto whatsoever shall, whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea. That's a commanding statement. You're going to speak a command. Commands put your faith in operation. You're speaking. You're not just saying, I have authority over you. You're commanding, putting that authority in operation. You make a command, you're telling it what to do, which is releasing God to do that very thing. And shall not doubt in his heart, this is a passive voice, meaning that he would be uh, separated. It's a, actually, the word means separated or parted within in the passive, meaning he's been separated in his heart from what he's saying. means he, now he's not in faith anymore. He let, something came into him that's caused him to be separate from what he's saying, so he's not in faith. Because if you have doubt, can you release faith? No, you can't have doubt. You've got to be in faith. He shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe that those things which he saith, the King James says, shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. Now this is the critical part. When it says, which he saith, those things which he saith, the word say, is that just that I say it once, that I just speak this one time? No, because it's a present tense verb, meaning that I say it and continue to say it ongoingly. Therefore, you believe that those things which you are saying and continuing to say, well, that means I'm saying something continually. And what am I saying? I'm speaking to this mountain, commanding it to be removed. So that means I must be saying it that continually, over and over, continually, which you are. Then when it says shall come to pass, does that mean, well, it's going to come to pass? No, it's a mistake. It should never be translated shall come to pass because it's not a future tense. We have to put the cursor over this one and show you the word ginemai, which means to come to pass. It is a present tense verb. It's not future tense. If it was future tense, it would be shall come to pass. There's future tense verbs all over the place in the New Testament. This is present tense. The way you would translate this is are coming to pass. Present tense means ongoing action. In other words, it's saying, you believe that those things which you are saying and continuing to say are coming to pass. That's critical. What does that mean? Everything I'm speaking, it's happening. If it is coming to pass, so they are coming to pass, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening every time I'm speaking. That's how faith is operating. It is speaking present tense things that are happening. You're speaking things into being. You're speaking to this mountain, and it all, as you keep speaking to it, it's happening, it's happening. It is coming to pass. There's only one translation, we pointed this out this morning, but we'll show you again, that translates this thing correctly out of all the translations I've seen. It happens to be this one called the 
EMTV here, which means the English majority text version. It's the one that was uh, by Maurice Robinson who did the majority text. Uh, we, it's, majority text has a lot of good things, but we don't use it because it's got some problems in its, its translation principles of how it approaches things, which doesn't make it accurate in some cases. Nonetheless, this was based somewhat on the Texas Receptus, but different from it in areas. Notice what he says. This is verse 23, if you can see where the cursor is. But believes that what he says, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. This over here. It's the fourth one. One, two, three, four. It's this one. Believes that things which he says are coming to pass. That's the only translation I've seen that says that. And he's right there right. They did it right. That's exactly what it says in the Greek. Now that's critical. That means you've got to believe that those things are coming to pass. Suppose you just believe it shall come to pass. You're not in faith. You're in hope. Hope is what confident expectancy is something will happen. But what does faith do? Faith brings the hopes into being. So what am I going to do? I'm going to bring those hopes into being by speaking those words to the mountain. And as I'm speaking that continually, they are it is coming to pass every time I speak. That is important. And we can, for, for all of you who understand deliverance, you can see how this would relate to not only moving a mountain, but also in casting out demons. Because when we speak to the demons to come out, cast them out, do we just speak one time and do nothing more? No. We speak, we speak, we speak. Every time you speak, what's happening? Your authority is being put in operation and it's working, it's working, it's working, it's working to bring the demon out, to drive it out. It can be resisting, trying to resist, but the authority will drive it out. Every time you speak, your authority is put in operation. It's the same principle as this. Now, if you don't believe that it's something's working every time, you're not going to see any results. But if you believe that every time I'm speaking, commanding that spirit to come out, it's working, it's working, then it's going to, you have released your authority and your faith, and it's going to bring it out. Same thing with the mountain. So understanding that faith is released by declaring what God is doing for you now, or speaking things into being that releases him to do something for you now, and in this case, to move the mountain. That mountain's being removed every time I speak. Mountain, be removed. Mountain, be removed. In a simple way. Mountain, be removed. I command you to be removed. Every time you're speaking, it's working. It's working. It's working. And you must understand that's how faith works. So, let's answer a question. We have a prevailing teaching in the body of Christ that comes from word of faith. And I'm not jumping on this just to jump on somebody. First of all, I went to a Word of Faith Bible school way back in 1979. I understand fully what they talk about. And after I began to study the Greek, I learned all the errors that there were that because I found there's mistakes all over the place. So I'm not jumping on, I'm just bringing forth truth because we got to have truth. The Word of Faith teaching says you speak to the mountain one time. And you believe that because you spoke, your faith was released. That's it. And that's it. You spoke more one, this one time and that your faith was released and that's all. They think faith is released at a one point in time and that's it. That's not so. Faith is continually released every time you speak. They have failed to understand that. Why don't they know that? Because we didn't, they didn't have any Greek courses for us to take. They didn't teach the Greek unfortunately. So they didn't come up with the fact of what these tense and voice and mood means, and so we have a problem. And so they reasoned that if you speak more than one time, well, you must not have believed the first time what you spoke was going to happen. So why are you speaking again and again? I mean, it just sounds like you're in unbelief since you're speaking continually. It's a failure to understand how faith works. Speaking more than one time doesn't mean you were in doubt and unbelief, you know, why you had to speak a second time or a third time. No. It's understanding how faith works. 
Faith works by you continually speaking, 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 speaking. Every time it's put in operation. It's not a one-time thing, and then if I spoke more than that, I must have been in doubt and unbelief. But that's the theory, see? They think that about prayer, pray one time, and that's it. Speak to the mountain one time. Same with casting out one time. I've released my faith. I said it once. That's it. No. That is great error. And one of the reasons they've come up with this is because of mistaken translations. Look at this. If you believe this without looking at the King James in the, here finding out in the Greek, you're going to think, I'm going to call those things that be not as though they already were. They're already done. So I'm going to speak at one time as though it was already done and that's it. I'm just going to speak to it once. They speak once and they believe that it's done because they release their faith. But that is error. Instead, it's calling those things not being as being, speaking them continually into being until they come to pass. So the, why do they have a problem? Because they didn't look up the tenses. They didn't see what the verbs are. And so that is a mistake. Also, they didn't see what the other, they looked at the other translations. And as I pointed out to you, are the other translations right? No, they're all wrong. King James, shall come to pass. No, it's wrong. Young's, you know, he's got that do come to pass, not really good. At least it's not a future tense, but it's not declaring what is happening. This is the New American Standard. Believes that what he says is going to happen. That's not right. That's contrary. So you say it once, it's going to happen. So they, build, so they think that that's what's going to be okay. ESV, that what he says will come to pass. That's all future tense. It's all wrong. NIV, what he says will happen. Future tense. NLT, he says here that uh, all is required for you is really believe and do not doubt in your heart. They don't even <laughs> address the thing about speaking to things. How, who, how they come up with that one, I don't know. <laughs> the Revised Standard Version says will come to pass. New King James Version, will be done. They're all wrong, every one of them. This is Darby's, an old, one and older before, said, you know, whatever he says shall come to pass. Every one of them, they're all wrong. This is a New American Bible, same thing. It says will happen. This is the Catholic Bible, one, the Dewey Rames one, and uh, they said, again, what he says shall be done, same thing, doesn't matter what background you are. Um, it's, it's all wrong. Every one of these translations, and I've looked at dozens of translations and there was only that one that was right, are coming to pass. How do we know it's right? Because the Greek is what it's written in. Therefore, if you understand that faith is ongoingly released and you speak in every time, not just one time, but every time I speak, it's working. It's working to bring it to pass. Well, this is why they have these problems. It's a major mistake. And we got the same thing when we come to the prayer of faith, because they say the prayer of faith is one time too. Therefore I say unto what things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you'll have them. The way they believe this, and this is also because of the translations, believe that you have received them. Well, that's a problem with the Greek text. And we'll show you this for a moment. First of all, the word for desire, pray, believe, and receive are all present tense verbs. We'll show you. This word, present tense, ongoing action. Pray, present tense, participle, ongoing action. Believe, it's a command, present tense, ongoing action. Then the word receive, lambano. This is a critical one, present tense, 
That means, you know, it's all present tense, which means it's ongoing, continuous action of the prayer of faith. You pray it and continue to pray it until you see the results. That's what it means. Well, we have a problem in the Greek text. This is the Westcott and Hort, but even there's one underneath this. This is, what, this is the current one that they use, the one that is the basis for the Nestle Land 28th edition of the Greek that all the ones use and all the Bible schools and all the scholars use and so forth. And they have it here. They have a present here. They have a present here. They have a present here. Otherwise, desire, the pray, and the believe are all present tense, just like the other ones. So it means ongoing action. So they, we're supposed to be doing things ongoingly. It looks like they're, they're in league with that until you come to here. They don't have a present tense here. These guys changed it. It's a corrupted version, and it's the aorist tense, which would mean a simple occurrence and the way you would translate that is that, that it ha they received or they did receive. That would be a simple occurrence. So they think that that means that I'm going to declare that I did receive it or I received when I believed. That's why they'll tell you, you believe that you received so why would I do it again? I, don't, I already did it, so I don't need to do it again. That's where they come from. But it's, it's wrong. Number one, if you have three present tenses already, how can you be ongoingly desiring, praying, and believing, and you're told to keep doing it, and yet you're only supposed to receive one time? Well, how am I going to keep on doing all the rest of them continually? It doesn't line up. It doesn't make it sense even because you're going to be doing the same. The praying is ongoing, continuous. So it's totally wrong. But what happens is then you see the translations. And here's one of the translations. In fact, let's go back to this for a moment. Look at what Young's translates this or the King James. Believe that you receive present tense or that you receive ongoingly. Believe that you receive. That would be a present tense. What are the other two? This is how, why they got off track, because they followed the other false Greek text, which we pointed out. This is the New American Standard. Believe that you have received them. Well, that's where they come up with it from. ESV, believe that you have received it. Actually, it's not even a good translation. Because you would say, believe I received, not have received. Have received would be the way you translate a perfect tense verb. And their tense is an aorist tense. So they've kind of added this, which is wrong. It should be translated, believe you, it, from their standpoint, believe that you received. Or believe that you did receive. Past tense, an occurrence that it happened. Not I have received. But that's what they go along with. And so this is how they've come up with their one-time stuff. But if I believe I have received, then why am I continually praying, making a demand of what's due me, and believe on ongoing basis? It doesn't make any sense. Because they did the wrong thing. They changed, changed it. So we have major problems because of the Greek text and because of the translations. And you look at the translations, they're all over the place on things. They're not translating them correctly. But when you look at the Greek, all four of these are in the present tense, showing the ongoing action of the verb. And that is important. Now, we'll come back to that in a moment, but we want to cover another thing that also shows the ongoing action of your faith being applied. And this is involving when we see the casting out of the demons. Let's look. we got six passages we're going to look at. Because they will tell you, you cast out one time, and that's it. It's done. You know, it's, you cast out, you released your authority and your faith, and that's it. That's all you need to do. Not so. 
This is Jesus casting out the demon. Look what it says. Jesus rebuked him, saying, that is the critical point. Did he just say it once? Hold thy peace and come out of him? Or could he have said it more than once? How are you going to know? You've got to look up this verb, this participle. It's critical because this is going to tell you how he was saying it. Present tense. Jesus rebuked him, saying and continuing to say to him is what it would mean. Oh, he didn't say it once. He said it and continued to say to him, hold thy peace and come out of him. And how do you even know from the context? Did the, whole, the spirit come out of him immediately? No, look what happened. When the unclean spirit had torn him, it was fighting against him. It was resisting, tearing at the guy before it came out. And cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. So what was Jesus doing? He was continually speaking. And we know that because look at it says in verse 27. They were all amazed and so much they questioned among themselves saying, what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For look at what it says. For with authority, that's how you cast out the demons, commandeth he even the unclean spirits and they do obey him. The word command is critical. If he just commanded one time, this is going to be an aorist tense verb. With authority, he commanded them. That's it. And they, they, they left. Let's find out what the tense is of the commandeth. Present tense, meaning with authority, he was commanding continually the unclean spirits and they do obey him. That shows you that Jesus was not speaking once. We saw it from the way he was saying it and the way he's commanding. He was doing it ongoingly. Let's look at another one. Mark chapter 5, this is the Gadarenean demoniac. It doesn't show you well here in the way it's been translated. This is why the Greek is critical. People that don't look at the Greek or know the Greek, they're going to have errors upon errors upon errors upon errors. It says, for he said unto him, sounds like he said at one time, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. The word said, you have to see what it's saying. It's not an aorist tense. It's what's called an imperfect tense. And the imperfect tense is also ongoing, but it's referring to, in the context of what was being said in the past. It literally would say, he was continually saying to him. That's an imperfect tense. He was continually saying to him, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And why was that? If we go back in the context, here's the man from Gadara. He sees Jesus, he runs and worships him. As he's worshiping him, a demon now that speaks here says with a loud voice, he said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. In the, in the uh, stream and time of what was being said, this is this demon speaking back to Jesus. Why was he speaking that? Why was he saying, you're tormenting, you, you're, you, you know, you're tormenting me. Don't come and torment me. I jury you by God, you torment me not. Because, the next verse says, before, or because he was saying unto him, come out of the man, the one clean spirit. Otherwise, in the time sequence, the man comes, falls down as worship him. Jesus starts saying, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And the demon speaks back and says, Are you you're coming to torment me in the, in the time frame. The point being is that Jesus was already speaking to him, commanding him to come out. That's why it's in the imperfect tense, which means was saying. What does that show? The continuous action. Let's look at another one in Mark chapter 9, verse 25. Jesus saw the people come running together. He rebuked the foul spirit, saying, that's critical. The saying tells you how he was doing it. Did he just say one time to him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him? No, because it's a present tense again. He was, it was, is saying and continuing to say to him to tell this thing to come out of him. He's, the charge means to command. It's the word referring to a command, translated command eight times, if you notice, the majority of time. It was a command he was making of him. Now, the other thing you have to see is, was he just commanding one time? No. I command you continually, 
present tense, come out of him and enter no more into him. In other words, he was saying continually, present tense, and this shows what he was saying continually, I command you continually, come out of him, thou unclean, thou, and enter him no more. So that shows us the same thing. And again, did he come out right away? No. This is why he kept saying it. Remember, every time you say it, authority is being released, your faith's put in operation, it's working, it's working, it's working. What happened? The spirit cried, rent him sore. In the face of Jesus, he was tearing at the guy, renting him sore. And he came out of him. He was as one dead. And so much many said he was dead. He must have really he went through the mill <laughs> before he came out. But he did come out. Why? Because Jesus continued to release the authority. Here's another case. Luke chapter 8, verse 29. Every one of these are all showing the ongoingness. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of him. This is one of the guys who had the chains and fetters. Well, the question is, command. Was he just, did he say at one time? No. In perfect tense, he was commanding, is the way you would translate that properly in the Greek. For he was commanding the unclean spirit ongoingly to come out of him. Same thing. Luke chapter 11, we see the same thing in verse 14. He was casting out, when it speaks about this, was casting out, this again, imperfect tense, ongoing action, a devil, and it was dumb, and it came to pass when the devil was gone out. It didn't go out right away, but when it finally came out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. So the, here this is, and when it speaks here about this casting out, this is, a, he's doing this ongoingly. It's present tense, showing that he was continually ongoingly casting out the demon. Again, that shows the very same thing. One last one that shows you clearly that casting out demons is not just a one-time thing and then I just believe it's going to leave. No. This is Paul casting the demon out of the woman at the spirit of divination. Look what he did. Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Well, the question, big question is, command, could that be an heiress tense? Could it be a one-time thing? He just commanded and he just waited for it to come out? Said, I did it, it's done. No. Look at what it says when we put the cursor over command. Present tense, ongoing action. It is critical to understand the tenses. It literally says, I I command, and I, continue, I command continually for you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. He's continually commanding him to come out. And obviously, it didn't come out immediately. It said it came out the same hour. So he must have had a battle for a while. He's commanding, 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 commanding until it finally comes out. What does that show us? That shows us, in all those cases, that it's always ongoing action of our faith being put in operation in releasing our authority to command something. In fact, we command mountains to be removed. We command demons to come out. We use our authority and release it ongoingly. That shows us. In fact, we know this, even you know it for yourself, if you've been involved in deliverance. You're continually commanding before the demons start to come out. Why are you continually commanding? because your faith has to be released, has to release your authority continually until they come out. Do they come out right away because you spoke the first time? No, in most all cases. In fact, if you just spoke one time and it sat there, would you see anything happen? No, you'd be sitting forever, nothing would be coming out because they can resist like they did. If they can resist Jesus, you know they can resist us. So what do we do? Well, we understand how faith operates. We continually speak, every time you speak, Faith is put in operation. Every time I'm speaking, when I'm putting my faith operation authority, authority's going, authority's released, authority's released, authority and power, it's working, it's working, it's working. And that's the same way it is in everything else. Now, all of the major prayer, all the things about faith throughout the New Testament, they all have the present tense. We already saw it in Mark 11:22 22 about be having present tense, God's faith. 
Mark 11, 23, you speak to the mountain and you're, those things you are saying ongoingly are coming to pass, present tense. Mark 11, 24, the prayer of faith, all four of those are ongoing. You continue to pray the prayer of faith till you see the results. We saw Romans 4, 17, you are continually calling those things not being as being, speaking them to come into being. We saw in Romans 10, 8, where the, 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 you're speaking this, this into being, uh, the word of faith is speaking things continually to bring them into being. In fact, let's just go over a couple of the ones that we saw, but we didn't actually look at the tense. When it says in 2 Corinthians 4.13 that we believe and therefore we speak, does this mean I just believe and then I spoke one time? No. This is the way the spirit of faith works. I believe, present tense, ongoingly. And because I believe ongoingly, what am I going to do to put my faith in operation ongoingly? I'm going to speak. Am I just going to speak one time? If it's speak one time, that has to be an aorist verb. Watch what it is. Nope. It's a present tense. Meaning, I, why am I believing continually? What am I doing as I'm believing continually? I'm speaking continually. I'm believing and I'm speaking. I continually believe as I'm continually speaking. What am I doing am I'm continually speaking? I'm putting my faith in operation to see things come to pass. When we talked about Jesus bringing things into manifestation, upholding all things, remember, bringing about these things, well, what does this mean? Present tense. Jesus was doing the same thing, speaking things into being ongoingly, continually. We also see other scriptures that we have looked, haven't looked at today, but this one, look at this, says, Hebrews 4, 14, see, and we have a great high priest passing the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. And what's he going to do? He's going to take what we speak, speak it before the Father, speak it before the angels, and so forth. What do we do? Let us hold fast our profession or our confession, what we're saying. Well, the big question is, hold fast. What does that mean? Does that mean I just hold fast and I'm just resting, standing on what I spoke? That's what a lot of people, I'm standing on the word that I spoke. No. Why? Because hold fast doesn't mean I spoke at once and then I sit there and do nothing. Present tense, ongoing action. Subjunctive mood means it's a conditional statement. If you're going to see Jesus operate in his high priestly ministry, you're going to let us, that would translate better, may we continually be holding fast, ongoingly, our profession. You keep speaking it. Every one of these are all that way. Now, we didn't bring this out also in verse 16 that we looked at, where we come in boldly to the throne of grace and taking hold of mercy. Do I just come one time? Is it telling me I just come one time? No. When I put the cursor over the word come, it's present tense and subjunctive mood, meaning that let me, let us, or may we continually be coming boldly under the throne of grace because it's present tense and subjunctive mood, meaning I have to meet the condition. Otherwise, I'm not just coming one time. I'm coming continually to take hold of the mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I'm praying continually. Also, in Hebrews 10, when we talked about the confession about our hope, remember, let us hold fast the profession of our hope. Remember, this meant hope without wavering. How about the hold fast there? Well, could that just be one time? Is there any one-time ones out there for these guys to grab hold of? No. They're all present tense. See, this destroys this false teaching that has pervaded the entire body of Christ and deceived them. They speak one time and they think it's done. <sighs> These guys failed miserably by not looking things up. You put your faith in operation continually. You can even tell. Here's an example how your faith gets built up ongoingly. Beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. 
Does that mean I just go, kolo la baka, ah, I'm all built up. I did it. That's it. No. Building up will be an ongoing work. And so I just pray a couple words and tongues, and that's about all I need to do. No. Praying ongoingly, present tense. You keep praying in tongues, and it brings a building up of yourself. It also brings a filling of the Holy Spirit within you. It is ongoing action. Everything that we see, all these scriptures are all ongoing. James chapter 2. When you're having faith with your works, even so faith, if it is not having, this is the word for have, if it may not be having, present tense, ongoingly, the subjunctive mood, meaning conditional statement, it's dead, being alone. Well, what does that mean? I'm supposed to be continually having my works, working my faith, ongoingly. By what? Doing the word and or speaking the word, putting it in operation. The whole point is, faith is ongoingly put in operation by you speaking and or doing. Same thing we see it well, down in verse 22. Seeing how faith wrought, or what does that mean? It just was working because I did a work once? No, I was doing it ongoingly, imperfect tense. How faith was continually working together with his works. Otherwise, as I'm doing the word, working the word, my faith is operating, it's all is ongoingly. Again, I'm ongoingly putting these things in operation. And then, you see then how that by works a man is justified. Well, does that mean here that it's been already accomplished? No. By works he is being justified ongoingly. Why do we say that? Because it's present tense, but also it's passive voice. It means he's being acted upon by God because he's doing something ongoingly by the works. By the works, what he's doing of the word, the man is ongoingly being justified or declared righteous by God as he is continually having his faith and works in operation. Every one of these are all that, the present tense, ongoing action in everything. We'll show, look, show you one other one that we've looked at, but we didn't, well, we did look at the tense on this one, but it'll just be a reminder for you. Hebrews 6.12, Be not slothful of followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Is inherit a one-time thing? Nope. How do we know? You have to look up the tense. Are inheriting, present tense, ongoingly, the promises? You can tell because it's faith and long-suffering. Why am I long-suffering? Because the circumstances haven't changed yet until my faith, which I'm working continually, produces the results. That's clear as a bell. So, faith is ongoingly put in operation. Now, in some cases, you may, not, you, you, you may not need to do it continually because the result happened immediately. For instance, let's say I heard the word and I prayed the prayer to receive Jesus. If it happened, well, then it's done because of what happens immediately. Same thing with receiving the Holy Spirit. I don't need to receive Jesus continually. If I received him, it happened. If I saw the manifestation of that, then there's no more reason to pray. But if it's something that has not been manifested, such as getting the demon coming out, or seeing the healing manifest, or seeing the mountain removed, or whatever, what do you do? You keep praying and keep your faith applied ongoingly until you see the results. So that's the answer for that, that there'll be some things, per perhaps, that you only do one time or for, until it's manifest. Once it's manifest, of course, there'd be no reason to pray any longer about that. But for something's not manifest, you continue to put your faith in operation. The whole point from this is to understand, how do we confess the word? How do we release our faith? How do we see our faith be working effectively to see results? 
You believe the word, you speak continually. You believe continually and speak continually, putting your faith in operation. And the way we confess the word is we bring the promise to him, which is that which has already been given to us. We declare what the word says, and then we declare what he is doing for us to bring that into manifestation, which is our faith speaking it into being. Calling things not being as being, it's happening. I'm calling things a healing power that's not being. Healing power is flowing into my body as I take hold of it. And what was my basis to do it? Because the scripture promises indicate that by his stripes I was healed. He took my infirmities, bore my sicknesses. He's the Lord who heals us. <clears throat> we have a covenant with God. So that, that shows me that all the promises belong to me. And then, and now, I'm, the, but this confessing what the scripture promises say doesn't release your faith to bring it in manifestation. You can say, by Jesus' stripes I was healed forever, but it didn't take hold of healing to flow into you. You can also say, I have authority over all demons and they have to obey me. Well, that's true, but that didn't bring them out. How do you bring them out? Come out. You can make a command, don't you, for them to come out, which is a release of your faith, putting the authority in operation to see the results. So, confession will involve speaking the promise which gives you the right for what you're taking hold of or acting upon. And then acting on that, speaking that into being, whether it's abusing your authority, whether it's taking hold of a promise, whether it's casting out demons, whatever it might be. And you, you do that ongoingly. Faith is released ongoingly until you see the result. Actually, it's common sense when you think about it in the spirit. I mean, if I just spoke one time and then I didn't see something happen, you know. Well, they told me I'm supposed to speak once and just stand, you know. But I haven't seen anything happen. What do I do next? If I speak again, they told me I must be doubt and unbelief. I can't say it again. That's insane when you think about it. Faith is continually released. What am I going to do? Keep speaking it. Keep speaking it. Keep speaking it. I command that mountain to be removed and it hadn't moved yet. So what am I going to do? I'm going to tell it to move again. I'm going to command that. I'm going to continue to command. Same way you resist the devil. You're going to resist him steadfast in the faith. I'm going to resist and resist. I'm just not going to speak one time and maybe he didn't leave. So I'm just, what am I supposed to do? Well, you're supposed to leave because I spoke one time, devil. <laughs> no, you keep speaking and resisting until he leaves, don't you? You keep speaking the word, whatever it is. In other words, Faith is put into operation continually. So you have the promise. Confession is speaking the promise that belongs to you and then speaking it into being. And what you say that God is doing for you now is what he's doing for you now. What you say God is doing for you now is releasing him to do it for you now. How do I get God to do something for me now? I speak and declare what he is doing for me now. Well, who are you to be telling what God is doing for you now? I'm just obeying what he told me to do. Speak things into being so that it releases him to bring it into being. That's why you're doing that. You're not doing anything on your own. You can do nothing yourself. All you're doing is releasing God, right, when you speak the word. When I use my authority to cast out the demons, is that me doing that? No. God is doing that as I'm speaking, commanding the demons to come out. Authority is being released in the name of Jesus. It's him coming on the scene to drive those demons out. So otherwise, every time you're speaking, what God is doing for you is putting him in operation to do it. And how are you going to put him in operation to do it? Well, I got to get him doing something. So what am I going to do? I'm going to speak what he's doing. I trust you're understanding all this and you are taking hold of it. You speak into being what God is doing for you now. What you say he's doing for you now is what he's doing for you now. If you don't say he's doing anything for you now, he's not doing anything for you now because your faith hasn't tapped into releasing him and putting him in operation. That's why the guy that says, well, I know I will be healed. I know God will heal me. That's hope. 
That doesn't take hold of me. I know that I'll be delivered to this demon because I have authority over him. He's not going to leave until you cast him out. <laughs> In other words, in commanding that demon to come out, I am present tense operating to drive that thing out. I command you to come out in the name of Jesus. That's what Paul said, remember? So you're, and what are you doing? You're just speaking for God, and God's the one who's doing it. I trust this has helped you to understand how you confess the word, how you use your authority, how you work your faith. It is always based on the promise that belongs to you, your legal right, past tense scriptures, promises, and then speaking it into being or doing something in a present tense action to release that to come to pass or release God to bring it into manifestation. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings clarity about how faith works. I believe the Word. I have the Word in me, which is specific faith. I mix it with my general spirit of faith speaking what God is doing as I speak it into being I'm releasing him to accomplish his word and to perform it in my life I will call those things not being as being which releases him to bring it into being I will cast out the demons continually which releases him his authority to bring the demons out I will speak present tense ongoingly releasing him to bring forth his word and his promises to pass I thank you I will start speaking things into being I will start commanding I will put present tense action which is my faith being released to bring every promise into being. Thank you for the truth. I will not fall for the lie that says speak one time and don't say it again. No, I'm not falling for that. That's not the truth. The present tense reveals ongoing action. I will speak continually, releasing my faith continually to see God accomplish everything in my life. Thank you for the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Father, I thank you for helping everybody to understand this, especially if they've heard all this other teaching out there. Thank you for helping everybody to see all these are present tense. It's, it's a no-brainer. There's none of them that are saying you just do something one time and then stand and don't say it again. I thank you, Father, for showing every person also, just like we saw in Mark 11, 23, when you say you believe those things, you are saying it is happening. They are coming to pass. It's happening now. Thank you for helping everybody to understand. You believe and you speak it's happening and you believe it's happening. Now you're in faith and you'll see results always. Thank you, Father, for establishing us all in this. We'll be hearers and doers of the word. We'll work our faith continually and see every promise come to pass. And every mountain be removed. Every devil cast out. We will see your mighty works be accomplished. Because faith is the victory. And we will put our faith in operation and see the victory in all areas. Thank you for the truth. We'll be hearers and doers of this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.